Excellent. So welcome to the Metasploit Framework demo meeting for March 12th. Uh, we've got South by Southwest going on here right now in downtown Austin. Um, don't use that as an excuse to move here, uh, but it's, it's a little crazy. But here we are. Let's talk about some stuff that's been going on. Some of the highlights from the last two weeks include a number of modules. Uh, first time community contributor Rotom Rice hooked us up with a new module to exploit vulnerable Drupal web services to attain remote code execution. Uh, this module relates to the most recent security advisory for Drupal core, which is noted in the, the slide there, which advisory that is. Um, and it also included various framework enhancements to Drupal Geddon 2 and the Drupal Mixin uh, by the time it was landed. So big thanks to everybody who worked on that. And I believe we'll have a demo of this. We also have a community member our sphere provided a module targeting vulnerable, vulnerable versions of Imperga Secure Sphere, which is a unified security platform that protects enterprise data and applications. Uh, improper sanitization of user provided parameters allows command injection via a service providing Python CGIs. Uh, is how that one works. It's very cool. Uh, contributor Tim Wright added a local module for rooted Android devices, which allows a non privileged user to execute a payload via the SU binary. This would allow you to use an existing session on a rooted Android device to download and execute a new payload as root, leading to a new session that's running as root. Uh, be forewarned though that when using this module, the target device may actually prompt the user for permission to execute the payload. And lastly on the list here, we have a new module for an older FreeBSD exploit. This is like circa 2012. Community member B. Coles contributed this module, which can provide privilege escalation via mishandled edge cases of the SysRet instruction for vulnerable versions of the FreeBSD kernel running on 64-bit Intel systems. B. Coles also did some detective work to locate the original author of some C code that's included of the module in order to assure that we had permission to use it, uh, which the author gave, and, and that, that was a fantastic uh, how all that went, so thumbs up. And I believe we'll have a demo of this as well. Moving on to some improvements. Uh, our host option is now supported in all auxiliary modules, thanks to community member Green M and our own Brent Cook, uh, allowing you to specify multiple targets when using ops modules. <coughs> community member Kale Black updated the local service persistence module to allow persisting services at the user level via system D, which is a nice addition. We had more in framework documentation, uh, which is great for everybody. I love those things. And uh, numerous module improvements, including check methods and also framework improvements such as support for unicast rep2 responses in RMI and DHA support in the full URI method of HTTP client. You can read all the details in the weekly Metasploit wrap up blog posts uh, at blog.rapid7.com. And with that, time for demos. Woohoo! Brent. Hi. Let me unshare. You go. Hi. So before I get too too close into this, I'm going to make a, a minor correction in this. Uh, this is one of those cases where um, oftentimes when a vulnerability comes out, um, there's a little bit more than meets the eye as far as like when it was acknowledged, when people knew about it, when it was fixed. Um, an interesting thing to note about this this FreeBSD SysRet vulnerability is it actually dates back to back when <clears throat> Intel was building their titanium processors and AMD was building their alternate architecture AMD 64. Um, back in the, I don't know, late 90s, mid 90s, early 2000s, um, you know, if you might recall AMD and mm -hmm. Intel were sort of in a war to see who could sort of own the server side of things. And Intel, you know, paired up a bunch of other folks to, to build this titanium architecture. It wasn't a great success in the marketplace. Um, in the meantime, AMD came out with basically a 64 bit version of x86 mm -hmm. and, and built their own extensions and all that kind of stuff. Eventually, Intel implemented the same architecture, but there was a slight nuance. Um, there's this call, system call, or this uh, instruction called SysRet, which basically um, deals with uh, um, how you return from a system call from user space. And, and uh, part of the, the kind of nuances between the, the two implementations between AMD and Intel is that uh, there was something that was left out of the AMD specification that wasn't quite directly specified, which was if there is a, um, a particular address formatting in one of the registers when you return from a SysRet call, um, a general protection fault will be thrown by the processor. However, on AMD processors, it throws it from user space. With the Intel processors, it threw it from within the privileged um, side of the instruction space. So basically what you ended up with was on AMD, it was not an exploitable condition. On 
Intel it was. Um, so just due to a, a mis, mis, in, in, mischaracterization between the two vendors of how this instruction should work. Something interesting, other interesting to know is that FreeBSD wasn't the first operating system to be affected by this. It actually affected Windows 7, NetBSD, FreeBSD, and the Zen kernel as well, which is, you know, of course, what powers all sorts of cloud providers and that sort of thing. Um, so uh, I believe it was the Zen, Zen group that in 2012 <coughs> released it, and they've got this really nice blog post. You can check it out. But what's kind of interesting is when they did their, uh, there's a really good write-up here that talks about sort of the differences between the instructions, um, the differences between Intel and AMD and how kind of, you know, the details matter from an, uh, from an interpretation point of view. But what was funny is actually this was fixed in 2006 in the Linux kernel. However, it turns out that the bug fix wasn't really indicated as a security bug. So no one else really mentioned it or realized that in 2006 that this was actually an exploitable bug in all these other operating systems. So um, it wasn't until 2012 that someone noticed that there was a problem in the Zen kernel and uh, eventually got it fixed in all the other operating systems and did a deeper analysis of it. So wow. some, some kind, of, kind of interesting stuff there, but yeah. effectively the bug existed is a hardware bug, not really a hardware bug, it's more like a, a hardware misunderstanding. And uh, while the OSs can certainly work around it, it does mean that since the introduction of Intel's implementation of the AMD 64 architecture, um, the, uh, all effective operating systems were vulnerable. Wow. Um, first of all, I'm going to just, on the left hand side, I have FreeBSD 9.0 release. Um, I'm running it through Vagrant. So here you can see I'm running as the Vagrant user. On the right hand side here, I've got Metasploit set up with the exploit module. Because this is a local exploit module, um, we need to have a session running first before we can use it. So I'll go ahead and use um, multi handler. And we've got the option set up to connect back to my local Metasploit console. So we'll go ahead and start our listener here on the right hand side. Left hand side here, we'll go ahead and uh, connect a reverse shell. I've already got one uploaded to the virtual machine for convenience. And we've got our shell, who am I, controlling the machine remotely. So we'll go ahead and background the session. Yes. Let's go ahead and use um, sysret. Let's see. Search. And we'll go ahead and use the exploit module against our local session. And uh, use show options. All right. So we've got a default into session one. Is that the session that I have? Yeah, session one. So let's go ahead and run it. What's going to happen is it's going to upload um, a binary that is used to escalate the privileges on the current running task. And then it will start a subsequent shell and connect back. Okay, the command shell opened, as you can see here. It looks like we did have a pause here at the end uh, during the cleanup phase. I'll just go ahead and hit Control C because it's not super important that we wait for all of that. But if you see now that's a result of running the exploit, I now have two sessions. I can interact with session two and see that I'm root. One of the neat side effects of this exploit is that it elevates the privileges of your running task. In fact, if I were to close the existing session or the existing shell that we, we started back to this point in the first place, type who am I, you can see that now you're actually already root, um, even though this is the same shell as before. So there it is. Uh, that's uh, the FreeBSD sysret priv escalation for FreeBSD 9.0 and 8.3. Um, as I said, this vulnerability, when it came out in 2012, affected a few other operating systems as well. Zen, Windows 7, um, was fixed in Linux in 2006. Um, so there's definitely a, a good history of this vulnerability. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks. Awesome. Will? Hey, can you hear me? We can. All um, right, great. Um, let's see if I can share. Share, share all the things. All right, can you see this? Yeah, if it's the GitHub PR for the Drupal. Great. Um, so I'm going to demo a couple things today. Uh, Drupal SA Core 2019-03 was recently released. Um, but people have been calling it Drupal Getting 3. Um, there's no real end to it, kind of like the ghost script slash image magic volumes. So <clears throat> we'll see if there's a four. Uh, it also has CV assigned, of course. Um, this is Rotom Rice's first module. Uh, he's part of, uh, 
He did, uh, I believe he was involved in the research on the previous Drupalgeddon, um, and uh, his company released uh, uh, basically a little write-up of, of how it works. And um, a lot of people use that for their POCs and such. So great work there. Um, definitely knows what he's doing. And uh, this is his first Metasploit module. Um, I think because he saw the last one. <clears throat> and um, so we worked on this together. Uh, he submitted a, a basic module based on my Drupal Geddon 2 module. And together we went through and we basically redid a bunch of stuff, constants, all that. Library mix and changes, um, updated Drupal Geddon 2, and wrote this whole new module for that. And so if you have, let's go over here. <coughs> if you have, this is the website. Uh, it's a sample website, of course. Um, if you have uh, REST, the REST API enabled in this with uh, all the right checkboxes for that, um, it is vulnerable out of the box for any very recent 8.6, I think. I think I'm testing 8.6.9, um, Drupal. And uh, uh, so you can see we're not logged in here at all, but it is a website and you can click on articles and you can see <clears throat> URL and everything. So um, we'll go back here, we'll start console. Now there are a few different methods. One is post, um, it also supports get and put and patch, but um, uh, post is, is uh, it should work repeatedly. Um, let me search Drupal. It should work repeatedly if it's not disabled at all in the app or um, in the server. <clears throat> and this is actually a PHP uh, unserials, uh, unserialized vulnerability. Um, take a quick look at this. Here's a little pop chain here. Um, I broke it all down into the individual components. Um, so arrays and strings and um, objects and such uh, generated using PHP GGC. Uh, a little bit of magic, oops, wrong key. A little bit of magic here to um, swap out some of the serialized strings. Anyway, um, We will set this. It looks all good. So um, you can also use get, uh, which uh, will be cached though. Whenever you request a page and you view it, it it'll be cached, um, the nodes that you request. So you can only exploit one node at a time, but if you use post and it's enabled, then it should work right out of the box. There you go, it does auto detection of the target. Um, tells you what it's doing and the big payload it's running. Uh, it's running it all in memory as well. Um, oh, there it is. Great. <clears throat> so that's that. Um, let me show you the Jenkins thing real quickly. So this is a work in progress. Uh, uh, orange Psy a uh, researcher released some um, uh, research on Jenkins, and um, this is a pretty interesting one where um, <clears throat> well, let's go ahead and see here that we are not logged into Jenkins at all. Um, no authentication is required for this. Um, this is a, um, a dynamic routing bug. So the way, let me just sign in here so you can see how it works. Um, this is still a work in progress, so don't, you know, rip on the code too much. Uh, or actually rather rip on the code plenty so I can fix it. Um, I have another commit here I need to push, but uh, this is a compiled Java class and um, uh, uses some groovy script annotations to download and execute the exploit or the payload rather. Um, here's where the real magic is. First gadget is um, 
So the way uh, Jenkins does its URLs is that all of these path components are actually converted into Java classes and method calls. Um, and so if you execute the right path, um, some of them are whitelisted where they are not, uh, you don't, you're not required to log in to view them. So if you actually oops, go to some of these paths, um, oops, let me log out so you can see that. You can go to some of these paths, you can see that you can access them without being logged in. I don't remember if it was XML or not, but... Um, so you can chain, chain that ACL bypass with other paths to directly access the uh, Groovy script compile page, and you can just basically send it this annotation chain. Um, uh, check should work. Oops. Let me set a payload too. I haven't set a default yet. Yeah, you can set HTTP trace true clearing screen or check. Uh, it's a little excessive, but um, you can see the get request here to check. Basically, it runs this, which, as you can see, I'm I'm not logged in. So, but I can do this, and I can search for users. Here's the admin user. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and run this. Uh, what I'll do is oh, I'm running uh, it on Jenkins on 8080, so I need the server on a different port. <clears throat> yep, so here's a single request. It chains it with the auth bypass gadget. <laughs> plus uh, referencing descriptors, specifically this one, and then runs check script compile with the value of this groovy script, which you can see here, it's fetching our payload as a compiled Java class and importing it. So the server reaches out to you, you send it the jar, you send it the stage, and you get a session as Jenkins. Um, yeah. Uh, Home. You can see um, this will all be randomized and everything, but um, we have some issues where it's not deleting the payload yet. Nice. In the in, it's a Java interpreter problem, but we'll we'll get that fixed. And that looks super cool, Will. Yeah, yeah. That's, That's what I got. Thank Good you. Job. I, uh, I'm gonna. If, if anybody's got questions for Will, um, maybe reach out to him directly. Uh, we're, we've got a couple more demos. I want to want to make sure we have time to get through. But that looks super cool. Thank you, Will. Um, Shelby, you want to sure. show us some some cool work in progress you're working on? Wait, me just to share and just work right in general. Um, so I've been working on this payload that. Um, can use both the bind and reverse shell. You can choose between the two. Um, it's supposed to have evasive properties, but we'll see if that eventually works. Um, we're intending to get this integrated into Metasploit, but right now it's just uh, like a C++ program. Um, let's see where else. Uh, it can install itself as a service. Uh, it can install itself, uh, like install a registry key to make it run at startup. Um, and it also encrypts its traffic, the Chow Chow 20 cipher. So I'm going to, I guess I'll show you the I guess the bind shell. Uh -huh. uh, and see if I have time for anything else. So this is the previous session that I had going. Uh, I'm gonna start this, start Wireshark, and then let's see. All right, so all right, so it's listening for a connection. Uh, so now I'm going to go over to my terminal. I wrote this, uh, it's like a bare C program to act as a handler. Uh, so that it can decrypt the traffic that comes in. So here we have it. Um, let's see it actually work. All right. So we've got a shell. Uh, let's just serve test. 
not exactly how I'd like it to be currently, but uh, it can always be fixed later. Uh, but we're, we're, we're work in progress. We've, we've, yeah. you know, we've caveated <laughs> it. it so, so you're all good. You're all good. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, here you can see some of the packets, some transfer and kind of just seeing nonsense here. <coughs> that looks uh, like it's looking encrypted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, awesome. So, so yeah, that's what I have so far. Um, you know, trying to figure out how to get this integrated in the mess uh, Hopefully that'll come up soon. Yeah. I don't know. Is the uh, and that they use it as also a reverse shell that you can yeah, work on yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, so you can yeah. do that as well. Cool. Yep. Yeah, that's super cool. Thank you, Shelby. Thanks. Um. Excellent.